So uh, no. Welcome to Bunker Hill Baptist Church and our Sunday morning service. I want to especially welcome any of our visitors. Uh, there in front of you in the pew is a welcome card if you would fill that out for us so we can have a record of your visit and be praying for you. We would just love to do that for you. Also, if you uh, have a prayer request for anybody, if you have a prayer request, there are prayer request cards in front of you. Uh, please remember to fill those out and place those off the toy plate as they go by. We just want to be praying for you. There's someone always coming up here every day to pray for those prayer requests, and we have an awesome ministry. Uh, so we would like to do that for you. Also want to welcome anyone that may be listening outside on the radio broadcast in the parking lot or at home. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this morning. I'm not going to go over all the announcements. By the way, my name is Brother Will Jordan. I'm the associate pastor here, uh, also known as Will from Bunker Hill, uh, your friendly neighborhood youth minister. Uh, it has been a busy morning. Uh, that's why I'm going. The caffeine is kicking in. We have had a wonderful men's breakfast this morning. I think we've had the biggest crowd we've had in a long time. Uh, and so we had a wonderful breakfast and meeting this morning because we have a wildlife supper coming up. Uh, but this morning, the day is not over, far from it, because we, after church this morning, I hope everyone plans to stay because we will have a Super Bowl fundraiser for our youth group. We have a wide variety of soups that have been prepared, soups and stews. We have uh, chicken enchilada, chicken ta I mean, uh, taco soup, uh, chili, chili, uh, Frito pie, Soup, uh, seafood bisque, uh, beef stew, gumbo, um, that's all I can think of off my head. A lot of varieties, a lot of stuff to eat, so please stick around. All you got to do is just come, fix your bowl, whatever you want, and just make a donation to the youth group. And so we would love to have you stick around and do that. And also this afternoon, reminder, there's a, a baby shower for Samara and Nathan Bourne, and that will be down in the gym. Uh, the FAC at from two to four, uh, so that's going on, all going on today. And I think there's some game, something tonight. I'm not sure, but most impo more importantly, we're having worship tonight, uh, so you can come back uh, for that. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be a great day in God's house. Uh, so a lot going on. But in your bulletin, uh, you'll see also coming up, we will have a sweetheart luncheon next week, and we're going to have something special coming up after the prayer this morning uh, to announce that. But the sweetheart luncheon, we have tickets available for those. It is free. Uh, all you have to do is get a ticket. I will have those available uh, as you leave, or you can just come see me or come by the office. But please get those today. Please get your uh, tickets for the senior, uh, the sweetheart luncheon today uh, so we can make sure we have enough food for next week. But you can invite someone if you want to grab extra tickets for friends, whatever. Please use this. Um, we have a lot going on, a lot of opportunities to invite people uh, to come to our church. So uh, please take that opportunity. Uh, speaking of another opportunity, we have the Wildlife Game Supper, February 26th. Uh, that is put on by our brotherhood. We're going to have a lot of stuff going and a lot of great food, a lot of great food uh, that you need to come and participate in. Uh, one thing not in your bulletin uh, this morning I was given. I have a pretty pink silverish bracelet. Um, Rex and Dr. Pace said this is not theirs. Uh, I've already checked. So uh, if it is yours, it, it will stay up here uh, and you can claim that. And uh, or if you know that someone, uh, you can let us know. But uh, at this time, Dr. Pace, if you would come pray for us in our pastor search committee. Amen. Thank you, Will. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you. Boy, after hearing that menu of soup, I'd like to ask everybody to stand now and let's dismiss. All right, here we go. And we'll just... Uh, some of you seem a little too excited about that. I saw some movement out there. But we appreciate you being here today. I don't know what the NFL is trying to do to us guys. Who moved the Super Bowl on the same weekend as Valentine's Day? We have enough trouble already in making sure. So, guys, be warned. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. That's your warning, okay? Still not too late to go to Walgreens and check out the clearance aisle and see if they've got any candy left or flowers left or whatever you... I see people poking each other out here. That wasn't funny, was it? That hit a little too close to home. But uh, we do want to wish everybody a happy, happy Valentine's Day tomorrow. And uh, let's have a word of prayer together as we get to, ready to worship our Lord this morning. Almighty God, as we come to you today, we are so thankful, Lord God, for another day that you've given us to be in your house together. <clears throat> and Father, to come together to worship you in spirit and truth here today. Almighty God, we pray in this moment you would prepare our hearts and our minds by setting aside all the other things that are going on in our world, in our lives, Heavenly Father. Take away the distractions of those things and in this time together, Father, make us hungry to hear from you, Heavenly Father, to hear from your word and the conviction of your Holy Spirit. Father, to have a chance to 
turn our hearts and our praise to you to exalt you and who you are and use this time, Lord God, to draw us closer to you, to make us more like you, to help us understand more about who you are and who you want us to be, Lord God, as we walk in faith and obedience and service unto you every day. Father, we would greatly pray as well that if there's one here this morning who is wrestling with some spiritual decision or change or commitment you're leading them to make in life, that today would be a glorious day in their life, Heavenly Father, where they would break free of all the bondage that Satan has used to hold them back and to bring destruction in their life. And today they would step into the freedom and the deliverance and the newness of life that only you can give through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Father, if it's a decision of salvation or rededicating their life to the authority of Christ, joining this church family, committing to some call you're placing upon their life, needing and hungry to grow in our faith. Father, whatever the need is this morning in our lives, make us hungry and ready to hear from you and respond to you publicly and privately as you lead us in this time. And Father, also, we want to pray this morning, continue to pray for the pastor search committee, Lord God. We just realize what a huge and important task that they have, Lord God. And I thank you for their heart, their devotion, their commitment, Lord God, that they've shown to this task as they're seeking your will, as they're connecting and talking to potential pastors. And Father, through their process, Lord God, I pray you would perfectly and divinely just coalesce their hearts together under your leadership and your plan. And Father, you would lead them to that exact person that you're calling to be the next pastoral leader here at this wonderful church. So Father, just do a mighty work in that process to bless them, we pray, Heavenly Father. Lord God, we love you. And most of all, we thank you for the love that you have shown us. Father, we celebrate love this weekend, but Father, the greatest love to celebrate is the love that you showed us upon Calvary's cross. When as the sinners that we are, you had every right to judge us and condemn us, but you chose to love us and redeem us by the shed blood of your Son. Father, we stand in amazement of your grace. We stand in thanksgiving of that great love and that love should compel and motivate us to go out and to live a life, Lord God, to touch others with that love, to see them come to faith in Christ and to impact our world, Lord God, for the kingdom of Christ and his gospel. Father, let that be done in this place today for your glory and your honor. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, good morning. Um, we were asked by the activities committee to do a little promo for the, um, for the sweetheart luncheon next week. So we're gonna have a little throwback to the 50s. Now we want everybody to dress like the 50s next week and y'all just listen to the words of the song. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around around the clock at ten o'clock. It's Sunday school. There's Bible study just for you. Sunday school rocks at ten o'clock. Sunday school rocks at 10 o'clock. We're gonna rock, 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 rock at 10 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, he'll preach the word. Very best sermon you've ever heard. Preaching rocks at 11 o'clock. Preaching rocks at 11 o'clock. Gonna rock, 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 rock at 11 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, there's a special treat at the 50s diner. We're gonna eat the diner rocks at 12 o'clock. The diner rocks at 12 o'clock. Gonna rock, 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 rock at 12 o'clock. So dress like the 50s when you come. That will make it lots of fun. You will rock around the clock. We will rock around the clock. Gonna rock, 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 rock. 
around the clock. Gonna rock, 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 rock around the clock. And the people said, I always love to hear and see those young folks doing something for God. And that was very good. Hey, Martha wrote all those words, too. Good job, Martha. Thank you so much. That's, That's doing something creative for God. Praise Him. Praise Him. My goodness, that's what we're here to do this morning. 149, would you stand with us? We're going to do the first and last verse, and then we're going to ease on into awesome God, because He is awesome. You ready? Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. our offertory hymn, Shout to the Lord, 133.
May we pray. a little bit while the ladies get in place there. We're doing by and by medley. It's not really um, just before preaching kind of song, but it's a happy, joyful song. Uh, we've been working on it, and it's a good song. Uh, we're going to have fun with this morning, aren't we, choir? I am. I might embarrass y'all, but hey, look, when the Spirit of the Lord moves, I'm going to move with it, brother. I, I'm telling you, I, I'm going to move with it. Um, you know, uh, 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 we, we would like to invite you to come join us in choir. We're we, we, we working on our Easter program, and uh, I know there's some out there that, you know, have been with us, and we would love to have you come back with us, and, you know, let's just have a good time worshiping God. Ain't that what it's about? God created you and I to praise his holy name, and if we don't do that, we fail in to do what God ask us and commanded us to do right so so let's just worship praise god okay i hope you enjoy this <laughs>
Amen and amen. Rex Choir, thank y'all so much. Children, thank y'all so much. Miss Martha, that was fantastic. Thank you for uh, leading them in that. Did that line in that song say he preached the best sermon ever or was it the longest sermon ever? What, what, I couldn't, I couldn't make it out. I just wanted to check where my donation was going, whether it was Children's Choir or not. But that was fantastic, y'all. Thank y'all so much. Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Man, what a, just a wonderful morning of music there to prepare our hearts to worship Almighty God. And it's Valentine's Day, so we want to talk about today what is one of the, the most important topics we can ever talk about in the life of the church, and that is understanding how God has loved us in Christ and how then we are supposed to love one another with that love. And the simple title of the sermon this morning is, <laughs> If You and I Are Going to Live for Christ, We've got to learn to love like Christ. I mean, if we're going to advance his kingdom in this world, we've got to carry out that great commission that Jesus put before us to love as he has loved us. So we're going to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Read the whole chapter. So if you would, rise with me, if you can, in reverence to God in the reading of his word here this morning. And the Apostle Paul famously in what we call the love chapter, he writes these words. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. For love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth, and it always protects and always trusts, always hopes and always perseveres. And love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease, and where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And you may be seated. Let's pray together. Almighty God and Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today. We are so excited now as this part of our service to have time, Lord God, to open up the pages of divinely inspired scripture, Lord God, and to be taught and convicted and instructed as your Holy Spirit moves in this place in this moment. Father, we thank you as the imperfect sinners that we are, Heavenly Father. You have given us the perfection of your Holy Word, of the life of Christ, of the work of his Spirit, Lord God, in our lives to guide us out of our sinfulness and more and more every day into your righteousness righteousness, living by your standard and your word. And Father, we talk about a very important thing all Christians must understand today, and that is if my life is going to count fully to your glory, if I'm truly going to accomplish the plan and the purpose you have for me, then the motivating force of my life must be the love of Jesus Christ that I have experienced, Father, in your amazing grace, and now wanting to share that love as the foundation of my life and my ministry and my service, Lord God. So convict us today, Lord God, and teach us about that, but especially convict us today as well, Lord God, that maybe there are people here who are coming to understand, and they'll come to understand even greater here this morning, that one of the biggest problems they have spiritually, Lord God, is that love, agape love, the love of Christ, is not truly the motivation of their life and of their service, Heavenly Father. And that's why it keeps coming up short for the intended powerful purpose and plan that you have. So convict us and teach us about that today, and bring about changes that you desire. Father, bring somebody today to just commit to, Lord God, and unite with the love that you have for us in Jesus Christ by repenting of their sin, placing their faith in Christ, and surrendering to him as their Lord today. Father, touch that Christian's heart that's here this morning that has made that commitment once upon a time, but Lord God, their life is not counting to your glory, and they understand the problem. They're not truly walking with Christ as Lord of their life. So Heavenly Father, we pray today that you'd bring them 
them forward in rededication and recommitment to Christ in their life. Father, we pray for those who you have led here to join this church family. They've not stepped forward and publicly done that yet, but they know in their hearts, Lord God, this is where you're leading them. Father, at the end of the service today, bring them down front to publicly, Lord God, officially unite with this family of faith in Christian service and ministry and friendship today and spiritual growth. Father, we pray as well you touch hearts and lives that you're calling to some great commission in their life, ministry, mission, something vocationally, Lord God. Father, we pray today that you would bring them to that commitment. And for all of us, use this time to grow us spiritually, to make us more like you for your glory and for your honor in this world. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' blessed, holy, and wonderful name. Amen. Well, since it's Valentine's Day, my Valentine's here, so I'll talk about her a little bit. Man, she has put up with me now for almost 33 years. I don't know why. I thank God that she settled for me. She could have done so much better, but I just thank God for her. When Dawn and I first met, we actually, she lived in Louisiana. I lived in North Carolina. <clears throat> Dawn and I met doing summer mission work at a Baptist camp in North Carolina. So we had that moment that, I mean, within three months, I knew I couldn't live without this girl. I loved her with all my heart, but she was in school in Louisiana. Louisiana. I was in school in North Carolina. We wondered how in the world we are going to make that work. And so we had one year of a long-distance relationship. Anybody else ever done that? It ain't no fun, is it? All right? Now, yeah. That, that one year was not fun, and finally I begged and cried enough. She transferred to North Carolina State University to where I was in school, and I probably wouldn't have passed unless she did that. So I'm glad she did. But So Dawn and I had that year that we were apart. You've got to understand, when I was in college, I was, I was just a poor preacher's kid, and I was struggling working and three jobs, you know, just trying to get through college and help pay my tuition and everything I needed to do. And now here I had this wonderful young lady down in Louisiana that I desperately wanted to see. This was back in the day. You kids don't understand this at all. This is back in the day where you had to pick your phone up, that kind that's plugged into the wall, not the kind you get to throw around in your pocket. And you had to pay long-distance phone bills. I know I look old at this point. I'm sorry about it. You had to pay a long-distance phone bill. I was, I was having to work another job just to pay long-distance phone bills. And so when uh, fall break came around, I thought, this has been too many months without seeing her. I want to go see Dawn. Well, Louisiana is a long way from Raleigh, North Carolina. I didn't know how that could happen. I, I called the airline and found out how much it, it cost to get a plane ticket. And I thought, well, I, I've never had that much money in my life. And uh, then a buddy of mine at college told me, he said, you know you can catch the Amtrak train in Salisbury, North Carolina. You can be in New Orleans in 16 hours. I said, really? So I called up Amtrak and I found out how much that was. And it wasn't as shocking a number to ride Amtrak. But it was a whole lot more money than I had. And I remember sitting after I hung up the phone there, looking around my room thinking, what do I have worth that amount of money? And the sad reality was nothing. And I started thinking, I've got to have something. And then it hit me. All my life, I've been a huge baseball fan. I love baseball, always have. My oldest son played D1 baseball at Southeastern Louisiana University. I just, I just love baseball. So all my life, I collected baseball cards. I, I was back in the day when that was really a fun thing to do, a great thing to do. And, and look, I had some great cards. I had some old cards I had collected. And I looked over at those big shoe boxes I had, and I said, you know, the sad reality about my life is that may be the most valuable thing I own at this point is those cards. And out at the fairgrounds at Raleigh, North Carolina, at the state fairgrounds, there was a, 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 a big yard sale that took place every Saturday out there. They had vendors come in from all over. And there was always a guy I'd see out there who had a baseball card booth. And I came walking up to him with those boxes, and I plopped them down. He said, what are we doing? I said, I need this amount of money. And he started flipping through my cards, and he looked up like this, like, these are good cards. And I said, I know. I said, you pick out what you need to get out of there to get me that amount of money. And he ended up grabbing a hunk of them like that. And he closed my box up and gave it back to me. He said, you know these are really good cards. I said, I know. I said, can you give me that amount of money? And he said, yeah. And he dished it out and he handed it to me. And I took it back and I went down to the Amtrak station. I bought me that ticket and I got to go to Louisiana to see that precious girl that I loved with all my heart. You see, the truth about that is what? True love gives you right perspective. True love gives you right perspective. Now, I wouldn't have given any of y'all for my baseball cards about two years earlier, okay? I was not who Jesus wanted me to be, and I didn't have that right perspective. 
But Dawn had given me in a big way, helped me with right perspective on life. And I understood that, starting to understand, you live by your priorities. And at that point, nothing was more important than she and I got to spend some time together. And so, sold those cars, got to have that trip. And I thought about that ever since then. Nothing is as important as what? Experiencing the love of God that he has for us in Jesus Christ and then sharing that love in the ministry and the service and the opportunities of life that he puts before us every day. I know this is a weekend that we celebrate romantic love and isn't that a, a beautiful thing to celebrate? All three of my boys this year are either married or engaged and I've had to do some counsel. Boys, make this weekend count, all right? Y'all make this good, and they are, and praise God for that. And I love to celebrate that. And I love, I'm going to take Dawn to Wendy's on the way home tonight and let her supersize. We're going to have a big Valentine's Day, all right? And I love celebrating that. But I love having Valentine's Day every year because it gives us another opportunity to do what we should do every day, and that is to do what? To think about what true love is. And to think about the immensity of the love that we have been shown by Almighty God in the sacrificial death of His Son, Jesus Christ, and then realizing what that love is, what does that mean for my life? And how should that compel who I am, how I live, and what I do to advance His kingdom in this world? You've heard me share the passage you before. It's one of my favorite passages in Scripture when the teacher of the law comes to Jesus and he asks him a question that was a big question of theological debate in their day. The teacher of the law looked at Jesus and said, Master, what's the greatest commandment? And if you'll notice, Jesus doesn't hesitate. Jesus very quickly comes back to the teacher of the law and says, The greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looked at the teacher of the law and just astounded his brain when he said, if you do those two things with integrity, with sincerity, with commitment, you will fulfill all the law. All the Jewish law, he told him what? You don't have to memorize it. You don't have to know it. If you love the Lord your God with all your being, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and out of that love, you love the people that God brings to you in life. You will fulfill God's law. And guess what? That instruction is still in force for you and I. That's Christ telling you and I, if we want to get faith right, if we want to get life right, if we want to get service right, if we want to get our legacy right, that's the love that we experience. It's the vertical love that God has for us as Almighty God came to us in human flesh and vertically came to this earth to redeem us out of our unrighteousness and through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, redeem us out of sin into relationship with Him. And if you and I have rightly experienced that vertical love from God, then it just pours over horizontally. And anybody I encounter and anybody, wherever I go every day, and whatever circumstance God brings my way, I'm going to be compelled and motivated and act and minister and react out of His love for me, showing that same love for others as I try to lead them to faith in Christ and encourage them in faith, and minister to them in faith, and disciple them in faith, leading them to become and be all God wants them to be. You see, you need to remember what John said in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. When John was doing such a beautiful job there of trying to encapsulate the glory of God, you remember the simple verse he gave us? As he's trying to talk about who God is, he simply said what? God is love. Hey, we can all do scripture memory on that one today. I think we can handle that one, can't we? I'll try to have that memorized by next Sunday, all right? First John 4, 8, God is love. Now look, I remember reading that years ago, and I, I thought I was so smart theologically. I wanted to argue with John and help him out. But hey, John, God is also holy, and God is just, and God is righteous, and God is perfect, and God is merciful. And I can hear John saying to me, yeah, he is all those things. But above all else, God is love. And just reflect on that. He is, isn't he? Have you wrestled with lately, philosophically, why you're here? 
uh, you say, Brother John, that's too much for 1130 in the morning. We can't do all this stuff. Think about it. Why do we exist? Why are we here? Why did the great God of the universe create us and make us and bring us into being? He does not need us. But theologically, the beautiful reality is he does want us. And he created us as his precious creations that he could pour his love and his purpose into, that he could have fellowship with, and that we would do what? Through faith in Christ, we would love him back in return. And as he loves us, we love him. And as he loves us, we love him. And it's the love of God, God is love, that should be the foundation of all I am, all I have, and all I do every day. If it's not... Your life and your ministry and your service will not be what God wants it to be. You see, the love of God is what we call what? The Greeks had different words for love. I've talked to you about that before. They had different words for love. But the highest love was the Greek word what? It's a Greek word you ought to know. Agape. Agape in the Greek is the highest form of love. Let me tell you a little funny thing. I read a book a few years ago, and they were talking about the concept of agape love. Before Jesus Christ ever came into the world, that word was in the Greek language. It had sat in the Greek language for hundreds of years. And guess what? When historians look back, they can only find about 20 times in ancient Greek writings that they used the word agape. In all the classical Greek writings we have, they can only find it 20 times. But guess what happened? When Jesus Christ comes into the world and he goes in our place and dies as our sacrifice on Calvary's cross, agape love got used what? Millions of times in writing. Why? Well, they only used it 20 times because we didn't understand agape love until Calvary. And at Calvary, when Jesus, the sinless, perfect Son of God, dies and takes my wrath, my punishment, your wrath, your punishment, your shame upon himself, then agape love was defined. Isn't it glorious that God already had the Word in existence? It had laid there for hundreds of years, and now it's fully defined. And agape love is what type of love? It is sacrificial it is unconditional. It just loves because it loves. Sadly, we don't do a good job of that, do we? I'll only love you if you love me back. That's kind of how this world lives. That's not how God lives. You better thank God for it. Unconditional love. He gives it because that's who he is, and he gives it to redeem us. It's sacrificial. It's unconditional. It's totally self-giving. And that's what Jesus defined at Calvary. And before he died, he looked at his disciples and in effect then looked at you and I and he said what? A new command I give you, as I have loved you. What did he say, church? As I have loved you, now you go and love one another. Have you dealt with that lately? Have you ever even thought about that? The immensity of the great commandment of Jesus. We love to celebrate the Great Commission. Praise God for it. Go into all the world. But this is the great commandment of Jesus. As I have loved you with that agape love, now you go love one another. In effect, he's saying what? With that same love. And that's what Paul is driving home to you and I here today that unless that agape love of Christ is the foundation of our life and our service and our ministry, hear me, our life for God and our service for God will not be, it will not come close to being the powerful force, the effective force that God wants us to be for his glory in this world. I love what Zig Ziglar, the great speaker and, and, and business coach, said a number of years ago. Zig Ziglar famously said, People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. You better hear that quote and understand it clearly. That's biblical. People will not, do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. You can stand over them all day and wag your finger and give them a lecture, and they're going to forget you and say bad things about you when you turn your back. But if you reach out to them in love and you walk with them on the journey 
and you share the love of Christ and the word of Christ and the teaching of Christ, you'll transform their life because they know that you love them. I think about it, my, you know, I've, I've had a few critics in my life, believe it or not. That's because I'm a very imperfect person. <laughs> I love the critics who love me. Those who come to me in love and share what I need to know, I value that and I listen to that. But the one who comes to me to tear me up because they don't like me, I have a hard time learning from that. I try to. But I have a hard time learning from that. But if you're operating from a foundation of love, I really cherish and care what you have to say. And so what I want to talk about this morning in the time that we have left is simply this. Understanding the, the importance of agape love, if we're going to live for Christ, we've got to love like Christ. If I don't love like Christ, I can't fully live for Christ. And so what do we need to understand about that? Well, the first thing is we need to understand what? The necessity of Christian love. In verses 1 through 3, we need to understand the necessity of Christian love. You got to understand the background of the love chapter. Isn't it kind of interesting that Paul dumps chapter 13 right in the middle of this discussion? Because if you look what's happening in chapter 12 and chapter 14, he's talking to the church at Corinth about the exercise of spiritual gifts. Okay? All right? Go out and serve. God's gifted us all with these abilities. The only problem in Corinth, you do understand, this is probably the most troubled church in first century Christianity. They're going out and expressing their gifts every day to do what? Draw attention to themselves to exalt themselves, to glorify themselves. They're bragging to each other about, I've got higher gifts than you do. Boy, this sounds like a wonderful church. I've actually been in that church. I, understand, I know that church. And Paul comes to them and he says in chapter 12, yes, there's spiritual gifts, and yes, here's how you ought to use them. But then he drops in the verse chapter 13 to say what? But if you don't do it out of a foundation of love, it won't really count to the glory of what God intended. If love is not your foundation and your motivation, then everything you attempt to do for his glory will fall flat. Listen to what he says in chapter 13 and verse 1. He said, if I can speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love, what? I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Man, if you can preach the heavens down and you're a great order, but you're not a loving person, he said, you're just going to be making a lot of noise that has no melody he said, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, what does he say? I am nothing. Well, if you're the greatest theologian in the world, you can understand all things. If you have a faith that's powerful, that you want to do mighty things of God, but you're not a loving person, he's saying, you try all you want. You're going to come to nothing. And then in verse 3, what does he say? If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to the flames that I may boast, but I have not loved, I gain nothing. Do you get his message? <laughs> he said it three different ways to you, right? If love is not the compelling force, if love, true, genuine, agape, godly love is not the foundation of who you are, you can go out there and do a bunch of stuff and it's going to fall flat on its face and it's not going to be what God desires because what God desires always radiates and motivates out of a heart of love. Man, I've had these people in every church I've been a part of that I really think they're some of the most ministering people in the world, and I think they have good intentions, but they're some of the meanest cusses you've ever been around. And they want to do great things for God, but they end up falling flat on their face and coming short constantly, not just in church, but in their homes and in their marriages and in their world too. And I talked to one little lady about that one time. Boy, she did not like the discussion, just let me tell you. I said, darling, let me tell you, I think you've got the best intentions in the world. I think you want to be used by God for his glory. But I got to tell you, you've got a mean, hateful spirit. And that's not Christ. And therefore, you are sucking the life out of what God wants to do in you and through you. If you can change that, and you can get dead serious that my motivating force is not going to be attention to me, 
My motivating force is not just going to be duty-bound Christianity, but my motivating force is the love of God that I've truly experienced with Christ. That's going to lead me to love others. I said, darling, I think he could use you to turn this world upside down. Because you got some gumption and energy, you'd be committed to do it. And I don't think she ever figured it out. And therefore, people still talk about to this day how mean she was. Well, what a great legacy, huh? And what breaks my heart is I knew her heart. She meant well. But she never figured this out. There is a necessity to agape love. The Apostle Paul said of himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 14, he said, it is the love of Christ that compels me. That's Paul telling you everything he was, everything he did, he lived under the shadow of the cross. That was the motivating force. So understand, dear friend, we're not talking about just a possibility you might need to consider. I'm talking about a necessity you better surrender to. Because if you don't, your life, your marriage, your family, your service, your ministry for God that he intended for you, it will come short and fall flat. And it won't be fun. The second thing is what? We need to understand the actions of Christian love. The actions of Christian love. Don't you love what the Apostle Paul does in verses 4 through 7 here? I heard some guy say one day that Paul defines Christian love for. He doesn't really define Christian love here. He tells you what Christian love does. Paul wonderfully reminds us here that love is what? Love is a verb. <laughs> All right, love is something we're supposed to be out there doing. It's not a philosophical concept that we talk about. It's supposed to be the guiding, motivating force of our life. And let's just make note of some of the things he said there in verse 4 and 7. The actions of love is what? What's the first one? Love is... Anybody else got problems with that? I need somebody to come up here and preach this part of the sermon because I feel horribly... At patience. Dawn and I, we were first married. We're growing in faith together. We prayed to God, God, we need to learn patience. He gave us three boys. Be careful what you pray for. And he gave Dawn me too. So she had four things working for her to teach her patience. But patience is why. The Greek word means long-suffering. The Hebrew word actually means long of nostrils. <laughs> It means it's a long time before God snarls at us. Is God patient with us, y'all? Can we amen him for that this morning? Do you realize if he was not patient with us, we'd have been judged a long time ago? So love is what? Patience. Patient. And if God bears with us, then we've got to do what? We bear with one another. And we're long-suffering with one another. But love is also kind, meaning compassionate and merciful. That's the heart it acts, acts out of, wanting the best for everybody. He says, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. All those negative emotions, love doesn't do that. It's not jealous of somebody else. It doesn't boast about itself. Love doesn't exalt itself. Love serves Love is sacrificial. Love is humble and meek to serve God for his glory, not what it gets for me. He says, love does not dishonor, dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. So if you're out there hurting others, dishonoring others, you're not loving. If you're out there just using people to get what you need, self-seeking, you're not loving. He said, if you're out there and you're easily angered, you can be quickly motivated to frustration and aggravation. Well, you know nothing of the grace of God because that's not how he's treated us. He's been long-suffering with us. I love this one. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Anybody want to talk to your spouse about that real quick? I did some counseling one time, had a guy come in. He said, Brother John, I'll tell you what one of her problems is. Every time we start dealing with stuff, she gets historical. I, I said, don't you mean hysterical? He said, no, I mean historical. She brings up everything I've ever done. Well, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, meaning what? It forgives. Love forgives, and it doesn't hold the past to the present. It's able to forgive and move on and walk together for God's purpose in the future. He said also love does not delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. Well, if you can ever find delight in the downfall of another, realize you have spiritual sickness. That is very scary. 
Don't do that. Love rejoices with the truth. God's will being done. Love is a motivation. It does what? It protects. It trusts. It hopes. It perseveres. It never fails. You see what love does? Love blesses, right? Love blesses and prepares a heart and a circumstance and a situation that God's will and God's glory is done and advanced in our lives and in this world. Hey, the third thing he talks about is this. If you and I are going to live for Christ and love like Christ, we've also got to understand the power of Christian love. In verses 8 through 12, beautifully what the Apostle Paul talks about is what? He talks about here on this earth, we now see dimly like looking through a mirror. Understand in ancient times in the first century world, their mirrors were usually made out of bronze and it was not clear. You could see your reflection, but it was kind of a, a dim reflection. So you could look in there. I've kind of always thought that's the kind of mirror I need. It'd probably make me feel better about myself that I can kind of see who I am, but not so clearly see who I am. So as Paul looks at life here on this earth and he looks to our future glory in heaven, he says, there we will fully know. Here we see dimly like looking for a mirror. He said, here I know in part, there I shall fully know. And what's he talking about? He's talking about the glory and the power and the beauty that it will be to experience the love of God, the love of Christ, and the perfection, the sinless perfection and beauty of heaven. Now, we're not there yet, but the power on this world is that love can still what? Be shown in us and through us, even if it's what? Dimly like looking through a mirror. That power is glory, but that power is so great, it can work through here to advance God's kingdom and God's will and God's purpose. Dear friend, you've got to understand there is power in love. Boy, I have counseled, I don't know how many couples over the years, hundreds, probably 700, 800, something like that over the years. I, I, and I've seen people come in and I've heard people say, well, Brother John, I'm telling him all the time what he needs to do, how he needs to change, who he needs to be. And I say, how's that working? <laughs> well, not real good. Yeah, I said, I figured that. Let me get an alternative thought. I want you to do that in love. Because the power is in the love of Christ that's been shown to us that now we show to others. I remember baptizing a lady at Terry in her 60s, and, and her husband was a tough old cuss. Man, I tell you what, his son had called me when I went to Terry and said, pray for him, witness to him, he needs to be saved. Well, his wife got saved pretty quickly. And so she started to come to church every week, and she said, Brother John, I get up every morning, I slap him in the back of the head and say, get ready to come to church with me. I said, I, I never, where, where's that in the Bible? I, I missed that evangelism method. And I knew she meant well. And I sat her down. I said, let me give you an alternative. I said, that's probably just going to provoke a fight. Let me tell you what you do. You, and she was beautifully growing in her faith, besides slapping her husband. She, I said, you just keep growing in your faith. And as God is loving you and you're learning about God, then you just live that before him. And you love him with the love of Christ. Well, Brother John, sometimes he doesn't, I know he doesn't deserve it. But you didn't deserve Christ's love. And God gave it to you. So now you give that love to him. Let me tell you one of my pet peeves. I'm sick of imperfect people expecting perfection. You hear me? I'm sick of imperfect people expecting perfection. Quit it. You tell me my problems, I can give you your list. Let's just all admit we're fallen creations, okay? We're sinners saved by grace. Who are you to expect perfection when you're not anywhere close? Why don't we just take hands together and let's walk toward it? And let's encourage one another. Let's walk with one another. Let's teach one another. Disciple one another. But I told her, I said, just get up every day and love him with the love of Christ. Yes, yeah, Sunday morning, look at him and say, honey, I'm going to church. Man, I'd love to have you go with me. And she took that new approach of love. I'd see her on Sundays. I'd say, how'd it go this morning? She said, well, he, he smiled this morning. Yeah, yeah, okay. I said, I'm, I, and I was coming by, and I was visiting with him too and sharing the gospel with him. 
And then one Sunday morning, I looked up, and right there in the center section, he was. And during the fellowship time, she made a beeline to I thought she was going to tackle me the way she's running at me. Yeah? And she grabbed me, and she said, look who's here. And I said, amen. I said, but now, don't change our approach. Love. Keep loving. There's power in love. And so I watched First Baptist Terry just love him. And at times, he could be a tough guy to love. And we all loved him and shared the gospel. And then he started coming to Sunday school. Then he started coming to my office three times a week. Won't talk about the Bible. And then one morning, I got buzzed by my ministry assistant. She said, hey, he is blowing toward the door. He's got a look on his face. Should I call the cops? I said, no, let him in. And he came in, and he, I'll never forget, he came in my office, and he must have weighed 350 pounds, and that big old dude fell into my arms. 67 years old. He fell in my arms, and he hit his knees, and I'm trying to hold him from falling. And he looked up at me, and he said, Brother John, can God really love me? I said, he's already loved you. When he redeemed you, when he created you, when he made you, he loves you. And he'll forgive you today. And I got to hold it. I got down on my knees and held his hands and we prayed together. And he trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. I baptized him, 350 pounds. The only time I've ever had a tsunami in the baptistry. Because when I got ready to baptize him, he was so excited. He dove backwards on me. We had gone through training. I had told him what to do. And I looked like a crocodile hunter up there trying to wrestle a 350-pound, six-foot-four dude. He threw himself backwards, and the water hit that wall, and then the water hit this wall, and the water hit that wall, and then the choir got wet. <laughs> From then on, the choir waited in the back during baptism. And it was the love of God in Christ, in his wife, in his church, in his friends, that brought him to that moment. The last thing is what? We'll finish up with this. If you and I are going to live for Christ by loving like Christ, the last thing we need to understand is the supremacy of Christian love. The supremacy of Christian love. Don't you love how Paul summarizes everything he said? In verse 13, he simply said what? Now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love the three great characteristics of who we are as Christians. Faith, hope, and love. But the Apostle Paul, under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, looked at you and I and said what? But the greatest of these is love. There's the supremacy of love. Now, when I was younger, growing in my faith, I used to want to debate the Apostle Paul, too. You see, I've got a problem. Yeah. Uh, early on, I thought I knew everything, and the older I get, I realize I know nothing, and thank God God does know everything. But I used to think, well, faith is so important as a characteristic of who we are. How can Paul say that? It's got to be faith. That's not what the Bible says. And as I've grown, I've come to understand what he's saying. I can have faith that can move mountains and still be an unloving person. And my life and my ministry come to squat. I had to deal with that as a minister at one point in my life. And now I talk to young ministers a whole lot every day about that. I look at him and say, I believe you got all the faith in the world. I believe you're hungry for God to use you. But brother, you do not love your people. And they do not respect credentials nor titles. They respect Christian love and faithfulness and dedication. That's what will give you a great ministry. So understand, dear friend, Paul may have just helped you as he helped me Define what the problem is with your life and your ministry and your service and your marriage and your family and your relationships with all in your life. The problem may be a lack of love as the foundational quality 
of who you are in Christ. If you ever have trouble loving people, always do what? Back up and just close your eyes for a second. Just close your eyes and think about Calvary's cross. And just get a good picture of the almighty Son of God, the perfect, pure Lamb of God being crushed and despised and destroyed and dying the death that I deserve. And I'm unworthy of that grace. But he gave it. And then open your eyes and look back to that difficult person or situation. And realize, if God can love a wretched sinner like me like that, then I can love the difficult people God brings my way. For the intent purpose that I be used, as my friend was to her husband, to help God work through me and in me to transform their life. You see, we as Christians, we don't defeat our enemies by fighting them. We defeat our enemies by loving them and making them our friend. That's how we greatly win our battles. In closing, let me give you something to think about. We mentioned earlier John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, where Jesus famously gives the great commandment. Jesus told him what? As I have loved you, now you go love one another. Do you remember there's another verse after what he says in the great commandment? Here's what the verse says. By this will all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. That's not John Pace saying that. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord, saying that. That's the high king of heaven saying that. That's the judge that I'll face at the right hand of God saying that. And he said, by love, living out the great commandment, by that love, all men will know that you are what? My disciples. If you love one another. So the negative of that is what? If I don't love as Christ loved, then I may not be his disciple. It's the logical conclusion, isn't it? I'm not trying to get you to doubt your salvation this morning. But I'm trying to get you to analyze it. Because if love is not the motivating force of who I am in my life, something's not right. And it may be I'm not in right relationship with him. It may be I'm not in right fellowship with him. It may be that I need to get saved today. It may be that I need to rededicate my life to the authority and the lordship of Christ today. But Jesus said it's by love. My love. Experienced and lived out that all men will know you belong to me. You are my disciples. So as Rex and our musicians are coming this morning, if God's convicted you that on this love weekend, I'm just going to try to give a good gift. I'm going to try to truly get my heart of love where it needs to be. In right relationship with Jesus Christ and then living out that love to my world that he sends me to for the purpose of advancing his kingdom. Maybe you need to get saved today to get that right. Maybe you need to rededicate your life today to get that right. Maybe you need to join this church family to be able to plug yourself into the world here of service and ministry to show that love. Maybe you need prayer counsel here this morning. Whatever that need. Oh, won't you come love him on Valentine's weekend because he loves you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in closing today. We thank you so much, Lord God, for this time you've given us to study your word.
Father, what a great weekend to be able to celebrate the love that we share among those closest to us, Lord God. But there's no greater love than the love that you've shown us in Christ. Father, we thank you for that. And Lord God, we know you commanded us, Lord God, to go out now and to share that love to our world, Heavenly Father, that it would open doors to where we could lead others to faith in Christ, we could grow others in faith in Christ, we could advance your kingdom in this world. And Father, if one here this morning has found something lacking under the conviction of your Holy Spirit that needs to be transformed, Father, if they need to make a public decision, lead them forward now, Father, for counsel in that time. Maybe privately right where they are in their life, they need to do that. Father, lead them to make those commitments and reach out to you, Father, for transformation as well. Father, let your will be done in this holy moment. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand together and sing. You come as we sing. 433 is I surrender all. It's time to surrender now. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. you'll come stand beside me. This is Heath Brown. Many of you know, you, you've seen Heath Brown, which you probably know his wife more than anything. Um, Charlie, Heath is coming. He would like to join our church as a member. He has uh, already been baptized, so he's coming on faith. So I just need a motion that he be received. Second. All in favor? Well, that was easy, wasn't it? Well, I'm going to ask Charlie if you want to come on down and stand beside your your, your darling husband here. And, and I want to invite everyone, first of all, that you come back to the back and come grab a bowl and uh, of just a, a lot of wonderful food and come back and support our youth group and uh, come by and shake Heath's hand and welcome in to this large church family. They're going to shake your hand off, but it's okay. We, we got food that you can come eat. Uh, before I go, before you are uh, dismissed, I want to brag on some of the youth here in front of it because they love it. Um, Byron Anderson. This week was voted or shown that he is Mr. Prentice Christian School. And the guy standing beside him, Gage Taylor and Madison Riley to the back, they were voted the most Christian character at Prentice Christian Senior Class. I like making them blood red, 
Uh, church, this is your youth group. These are the wonderful kids that make up, and this is the stuff that they're doing in their schools, and they're a wonderful group of kids. So I want to encourage you today as we highlight here uh, this lunch that you get to know these kids uh, because they are doing wonderful things for God's kingdom, and come support Heath and his decision to join us. Brother David Brown, if you pray for us, we dismiss.